Welcome back. In the last video we started looking at how you can do geometry on the sphere. We saw that straight lines on the sphere are great circles, and isometries of the sphere fall into one of the following categories. The identity, reflections, rotations, and glide reflections. The aim of this video is to think about tilings or tessellations, which were the topic last week and see what happens on the sphere instead of in the plane. What do we mean by a tiling of the sphere? We can draw inspiration from tilings of the plane. A tiling of the sphere is a pattern which covers the whole sphere and which is made up of lots of copies of the same basic repeating unit. So here's an example, here's another one if you ignore the different colours, and here's a third. Since the pattern is made up of lots of copies of the same basic tile, it will have non-trivial symmetries. As we did last week, we can try and find a fundamental domain, a tile which every symmetry of the pattern sends to a different tile. For the football, we can first divide up the pattern like this. See how the whole sphere is covered by copies of this pentagon. But then we can further subdivide this tile into 10 smaller triangles. We can choose one of these triangles as a fundamental domain. For the beach ball, without the colours, hopefully you will agree that this is a fundamental domain. A shape like this on the sphere is called a loon. The name is derived from the Latin for moon because it is somewhat crescent shaped. Last week, Albert ruled out tilings of the plane which had an infinite strip as their fundamental domain. For similar reasons, it makes sense for us to ignore tilings of the sphere which have a loon as their fundamental domain. This is because the surface of a sphere is a two-dimensional object, but if a loon is the fundamental domain for the pattern, all the symmetries are acting along the same single line so they aren't really making use of the whole two-dimensionality of the sphere. If you had a go at the first lot of exercises last week, you had the chance to think about regular tilings of the plane. We can also think about regular tilings of the sphere. A regular tiling of the sphere is a tiling made up of congruent copies of a single regular spherical polygon. That is, a polygon on the sphere where all the side lengths and internal angles are the same. For such a tiling to be regular, we also insist that the tiles match up edge to edge. In the last set of exercises, you should have seen that the angles in a spherical triangle add up to more than 180 degrees. If you have a spherical triangle with one corner at the North Pole and two corners at the equator, the two angles at the equator are each 90 degrees, which is already 180 degrees before we factor in the angle at the North Pole. Alternatively, think about an equilateral triangle on the sphere. As we make the edges longer or shorter, the angles change, but crucially, each angle is always greater than 60 degrees the size of the angle would be for an equilateral triangle in the plane. Similarly, the internal angles of a regular spherical polygon always add up to more than the internal angles in the corresponding Euclidean regular polygon. In a regular tiling, the same number of polygons have to meet around each corner. At least three have to meet at each corner, because if only two did, the internal angles would have to be 180 degrees, so it would be an edge, not a corner. In general, the internal angles of the polygons around a point have to add up to 360 degrees. We can now try out the different regular polygons to find the possible regular tilings of the sphere. For equilateral triangles, the internal angle is greater than 60 degrees, so at most five can fit around a corner. If we put 3 around a corner, we get this tiling. 4 gives this one, and 5 gives this one. If we try and fit 6 around a corner, the triangle would have to have internal angles of exactly 60 degrees, and then the triangle would tell the plane, 
not a sphere. For squares, the internal angle will be greater than 90 degrees, so we could only fit three around a corner. For pentagons, the angle will be more than 108 degrees, and again, we can only fit three around a corner. For a regular hexagon, heptagon, octagon, and so on, the internal angles will be greater than 120 degrees, so you can't even fit three around a corner, and there are no regular tilings for any of these shapes. This means that there are five regular tilings. Do these tilings remind you of anything? They might remind you of the five platonic solids, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the icosahedron, the cube, and the dodecahedron. In fact, if we flatten off each of the tiles in these tilings, we get the corresponding platonic solid. And if we inflate each of the platonic solids, we get the corresponding tiling. This is true for any polygonal tiling, not just the regular ones. For example, the polyhedral version of a football is called variously a truncated icosahedron, a chamfered icosahedron, or a truncated rhombic tricontahedron. In general, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between polygonal tilings of the sphere and convex polyhedra. We might swap back and forth between these two viewpoints, as is convenient in these videos. We've spent a lot of time thinking about the geometry of the plane, and some time thinking about the geometry of the sphere. Hopefully you've noticed that there are some important differences. Angle sums in triangles, for example, or that there's no such thing as parallel lines on the sphere. These differences, however, are in the details, and a lot of the broad ideas and overarching themes are exactly the same. One example of this is with groups of symmetries. Given a tiling of the sphere, its symmetry group is the collection of all symmetries of the pattern. In other words, the collection of all isometries of the sphere which leave the tiling looking the same. All groups of symmetries contain the identity, because the identity leaves every pattern looking the same. We can also always combine two symmetries to get another as before, and every symmetry is reversible, and therefore has an inverse, which is also in the group. In short, the definition of a group of symmetries on the sphere is exactly the same as a group of symmetries in the plane. In the plane, we saw that groups of symmetries of shapes, in particular polygons, were finite in size, whereas groups of symmetries of tilings were infinite in size. On the sphere, all the symmetry groups of tilings are finite. This comes from the fact that the sphere is itself compact. Remember, this means that it has finite size and no edges. Since it has finite size, it can contain only finitely many congruent copies of a tile. But if we have a group of symmetries of a tiling, we can find a fundamental domain, and we saw last week that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between copies of the fundamental domain and the symmetries in the group. Finitely many tiles means finitely many copies of the fundamental domain, and so finitely many symmetries in the group. Oddly enough, this doesn't necessarily make the groups of symmetries of spherical tilings any easier to understand than those of tilings of the plane. Our goal to understand groups of symmetries will still be to find generators for the group, a handful of symmetries from which all other symmetries can be made. Next week, Albert will talk more about groups of symmetries for tilings of the sphere. For now, to finish off this video, I want to have a bit of fun. Everything we've done so far, we've just presented you with a tiling of the plane, or of the sphere. Let's talk about how you can create new tilings from old ones. I'm going to say everything for the sphere case, but it works in exactly the same way for the plane. Let's start with a simple tiling, say the tiling by squares, or the cube. Remember, I'm not going to worry about the distinction between a spherical tiling and a polyhedron. The first thing we can do to get a new tiling is a process called subdivision. First, choose one of the faces. 
and cut it up into smaller polygons. In principle, you can do this however you like, but if you do it in a way which respects the symmetry of the face, you will not destroy any of the symmetries of the overall tiling. Next, you need to apply exactly the same subdivision to all symmetric copies of that face. Finally, if you're doing this with a polyhedron rather than a sphere, you probably want to make the new corners you've made stick out a bit. Just like that, you have a new tiling. In this case, we have gone from the cube to a shape called a tetrarchus hexahedron. You can also undo a subdivision, and you don't have to undo it in the same way that you originally subdivided, so long as you combine faces in a way respecting the symmetries of the pattern. So, if we merge faces like this, we end up not with a cube, but with the rhombic dodecahedron. The other way of modifying a tiling of the sphere that I'm going to tell you about is called dualizing. This is quite a fun procedure. Start out with a polygonal tiling and add a point to the center of every face. Where two faces meet, join the corresponding two new points by a line. Finally, in the original, the faces fit perfectly around each corner. This means that after the first two steps, each corner is now encircled by a sequence of edges forming a polygon. Fill in this polygon with a new face. If you now get rid of the original, you have a new polygonal tiling with a corner wherever there used to be a face, a face wherever there used to be a corner, and edges at cross purposes to the originals. Doing this to the cube, you can see that the result is an octahedron. When we dualize, you can see that we have swapped corners and faces. So you might expect that if we dualize again, we should swap everything back and return to where we started. Taking the dual of the octahedron, we indeed get the cube. And in fact, this always works. The exercises are a chance to play with these two processes and see what happens when you combine them. I'll just finish off by inviting you to think about what happens to the group of symmetries of a tiling or polyhedron when we subdivide or dualize. Since dualizing twice gets you back to where you started, you might guess that it can't do much to the symmetry group, and similarly for subdividing. This turns out to be partially true. However, in one of the exercises, I've asked you to use these two processes to transform both a tetrahedron and a cube separately into a truncated octahedron. The tetrahedron and cube have different symmetry groups, and the truncated octahedron clearly can't have both groups of symmetries at the same time. So somewhere in this process, the group of symmetries must have been messed up. Now it's your turn to have a go at playing with polyhedra, spherical tilings, and symmetry groups. That finishes us off for this week. Albert will be back next week where we will conclude the course. See you then.